everyone to the meeting. Uh, sorry we started uh, badly, but we're going to get back on track. Um, so first of all, Raquel, um, could you introduce yourself again? Is yeah. that okay? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm Raquel <laughs> and I am a massage therapist. I've been working for a few years and yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah, and, and you, yeah, last time I said, um, how did you get into healing? Yeah, well, I always like to, to work with people. I study hairdressing and beauty, but I, it, it wasn't enough for me. Like, it, it wasn't the way I would like it to help them. Yeah. So I start massage. And, but yeah, I, I say last time that until I went to India and I feel myself with this touch, I wasn't confident to start treating others. Yeah. So start like this, maybe my alopecia as well help to be a bit more Yes, that's the other that's the other one. This is like the the fact that we're wounded healers, a lot of us, you know. Yeah. So that's often how, how people get into healing because yeah. they've had something and that was like a big challenge for you. Yeah, it was. But yeah, it was the history of my life. <laughs> but but yeah, it yeah. made me very in my own world because I did people didn't accept how I was, even my family was like pushing me away because I was different. Oh, wow. But yeah, no, I think, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, here I found amazing people like, but yeah, well, yeah, this is me. <laughs> I yeah, no, I mean, I, cause it, I mean, yeah, I can relate somewhat. I was just thinking, I was thinking like, yeah. it's interesting what you've done, isn't it? Because you've made it a feature and you sort of, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, cool. it's cool. It's like, yeah, embracing these things is, yeah. So, and Deborah, um, yeah. could you introduce yourself, please? Oh, um, hi, I'm Deborah, yeah. and um, <clears throat> I work at the Anahata. I've been working there since it started because I basically run the place, and um, <laughs> but luckily, I don't have to do reception anymore because I hate doing reception. And um, that's about it, really. Excellent. And how did you get in? I know we, I know you said last week how you got into healing. Um, how did I get into what? Well, into your, your, your brand of healing. How did you get into it? Oh, um, I got into, um, I'm an acupuncturist. And I got into that because, um, because I had some problems and somebody recommended acupuncture. I tried lots of other things and it didn't help me at all. And I was really desperate because I was only 19 and I was in a lot of pain. And so um, somebody said, oh, you should go and see an acupuncturist. I was, cause I was living near an acupuncture college. So there was a lot of acupuncturists around and I did. And it was all very strange and I thought it was gonna be a load of rubbish and um, actually they really helped me. The guy asked me loads of questions about things that I didn't really care about, didn't see how it was relevant. And then um, I just really liked the way he was in himself. And so I kind of put it to the back of my mind and thought, oh, that looks like a really cool job. I'd quite like to do that and then forgot about it. <clears throat> but he made me loads better. So that was really good. Um, that and the osteopathy at the same time, <clears throat> which is why I really like acupuncture with osteopathy. And then um, yeah um many years later 10 years later a light came on in my head and it said now's the time to study acupuncture so knock me over with a feather i found the um the most by that time i had two kids i found the closest acupuncture college and um signed up and that's it that's how i got into it and it was a real homecoming when i was when i was studying it it really felt like wow why didn't they tell me this before? This makes so much sense. So it was really good for me. Ah, oh, <clears throat> Phil, Daniel's in the Zoom waiting area. Oh, oh my God. Um, yes, I see him. Cool. Excellent. <laughs> oh, brilliant. What, what, have, have we lost um, Venetia? She... I don't know. Maybe she forgot. Oh, yeah. She's forgiven. She's got a tiny baby. Yes. <laughs> hello, hello, Daniel. Hi. Hi. 
Good to see you. I, well, I tell you what's happening. I'm so sorry we're a bit late starting. Um, totally our fault. Um, it, it, um, Danielle, could you introduce yourself? What, what's your healing modality and how did you get into it? Uh, yeah, so I'm an acupuncturist and uh, now a herbalist too. And how did I get into it? Um, uh, <laughs> don't know. <laughs> Just sort of happened. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, I treated my, um, I was, I guess it started a long time ago, really. So my parents actually took me for acupuncture when I was little. Maybe that kind of like opened oh. my mind up to the idea. Yeah. And uh, then I got treatment myself in my mid twenties um, for uh, asthma, and that kind of uh, I think the acupuncture and a little bit of uh, like martial arts qigong, mm -hmm. and it kind of just really got rid of it in a good way. Oh wow! So yeah, then I yeah had the application on my desk for a year or so. And then I just went for it and yeah, studied. Where did you study? Uh, so I did a study, I did a Westminster's acupuncture course, uh, Westminster Uni. So it was, uh, it was good at the time that I did it. It was pretty, um, pretty big. It had been like a, a kind of a sort of popular course. And I think on my first day, there were 45 oh, wow. students. So I was sitting in a room with all these people like, oh, we're all going to be acupuncturists. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like at any of those courses, it drops down yeah. pretty dramatically. But I think there were still about 20 of us that ended, ended in the third year together. So went through from that first day. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was good, a good time, I think. Good training. No, it's inter that's interesting because there's this sort of um, following the idea of the people getting into healing who've got some sort of illness or something and you that your story is more like getting in through martial arts perhaps is that mm -hmm. yeah so i had this uh, i had this martial arts teacher so at the time we were all like you know in our early 20s doing like a lot of kung fu and wanting to sort of kick ass yeah kind of right and uh, the martial arts teacher, he started a Qigong class. And for those people that don't know, Qigong is kind of like the kind of health side of um, the martial arts world in a way. It kind of connects to Chinese medicine and Chinese culture and a little bit like Tai Chi, but without the fighting, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of very slow meditative movements. So he was like, okay, told the martial arts group, we're going to start this Qigong now and I'm going to do it an hour and then we'll do our martial arts before class and the first week everyone from the martial arts class was there yeah there's yeah. you know 35 martial artists okay <laughs> staying still relaxing and then i think by the third week it was just me and him really? and one other person Wait, were, all, were they all boys in, in the martial arts class no it was a good mix it was a good yeah. mix but everyone was pretty young yeah uh, it was all sort of yeah early mid-20s people and um yeah, so by the third week, it was just me and him. And, and then, so me and him and this one other guy, and the three of us would do an hour of Qigong. And then we would do the martial arts. And I felt like my health from doing this twice a week, this hour of Qigong was just like, Phew. so uh, it was sort of that, doing the martial arts Qigong culminated with me going to get treatment myself. Sort of, so it's all like that kind of age where you like take things on yourself, like, okay, I got to deal with this. Um, and I went to see a lady for acupuncture and she was a Chinese woman who sort of said, well, look, it's this time of year, it's autumn, the leaves are drying out. This is why you're getting dryness in your lungs. And I was like, oh, it's really beautiful. That really kind of like clicks with me a bit. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, and so that's kind of my sort of passion for, for sort of healing and healing arts started around that time, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's quite a lot of interesting um, things there. Sort of the that's uh, just because I, I connected with Ra, I'm Deborah. When I say Ra, I mean Deborah. By the way, <laughs> I say that because that's what she can get to call at home. Uh, but yeah, she saw the, the climate, the uh, the weather, the seasons, the cycles. 
that is definitely interesting. Yeah, and to go to like a doc, a sort of doctorish type person yeah. and have them say that to you, you're like, oh, yeah. this is not really? normal. <laughs> this is not normal medicine stuff, is it? This is this is yeah. So and they helped you with asthma. Yeah, so I think it was sort of like it really uh, just. Um, I'd had bad asthma as a child and then it kind of went away a little bit and then it sort of came back kind of with a vengeance and uh and um I think the chi gong and the acupuncture sort of combined sort of made me you know I think yeah having treatment made me look at my own health in a different way and that sort of sparked some kind of healing in my body I guess <laughs> like a healing journey and uh it was pretty remarkable really so from from like a, you know a lifetime of these inhalers they just give you tons of them to being in a place where i don't use them i don't need them I haven't had them for years now so you know there's one in the cupboard probably expired a few years ago but it's not you know i don't need it so so yeah i think it was also that kind of like here's a medication that you're going to take for the rest of your life. And, uh, you know, it never sat well with me, you know, even as a child, I would just, they would give me this steroid and I would take it for two days and then I'd hide it and I wouldn't take it. And then, you know, go back to the doctor and be like, are you taking your steroid? Like, uh, well, not really. No. <laughs> Keep taking it. That's very common, isn't it? It's very common. Um, so, I thought also Chinese medicine offered like it offered a way to think about not being on medication your whole life, like a way, a sort of a way out of that yeah. cycle. Yeah. Um, so that was like personal and political for me. <laughs> and I felt like, oh, that's a good. Political in, in the sort of health politics. Realms, yeah. Mean? The health politics. Yeah. I remember there was an artist they used to know and he said like, it doesn't matter if you make political art or not. Being an artist is like a political act in itself, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I feel a little bit about like that about being a health practitioner. It's like, it doesn't matter whether you're super, you know, political with what you do, but it's just the fact that you're doing that is also already political in a way. No. Yeah, actually health is, I mean, you know, almost pressing the third rail here but it's become central politics isn't it just the last few years health yeah yeah and i sort of think like that artist statement is like you don't have to get involved in the in the argument <laughs> just have to have in a way yeah you're, but you're in the, you're, you're demonstrating it you're being the change or something something uh... yeah of course so so no we've got this idea of talking about sort of well, we can talk about whatever we want, but I did, uh, I'm, I'm sort of going to try and stimulate us to talk about maybe some patient, or we could talk about, you know, a patient, did, did you get the email? <laughs> did you get the memo where I suggested that? Uh, we could talk, we, we actually had quite an interesting meeting last week. We talked about uh, a patient, but then the lady that was talking about it, um, didn't realize that we were going to put it on the internet <laughs> and felt didn't, she didn't want to put, put it up because she didn't want yeah you know, it was a difficult patient so she just didn't feel like talking about it even though they weren't identified mm. but uh, so there's a little bit of a well you know i suppose we've got a, a natural rest reticence sort of, but, but then then there's patients from the past and um, you know people who could talk about i'm sure did, did, did you did that come across has anyone got a patient they'd be interested in uh, bringing up a, a case history anonymized mm. <laughs> oh this is the awkward bit where i have to keep talking because <laughs> like you know um that seems to be traditional you um, want to adjust your green screen which is only halfway across the back of your head <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Better? Yeah, that's perfect. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. I'm sure. It's, uh, I wish I had a, a, back, a, a better background. Um. So yeah, I mean, any, anyone? Uh, shall I? Shall I point to somebody? You know, it's like a. That's horrible. 
No. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could talk about something else. We haven't got that. About you know weather, the weather actually, and in a, oh, in a no. I, what about what about um you know sort of um health as a as a radical action? I'd like to talk about that. I'd like to talk about the fact that um we're in this world where people are beginning to uh, realize that um health is something that they can actually do for themselves and um you know that whole idea about taking charge of your health i think that's really important and the more i do this the more i feel that i'm i'm not really doing very much more than just kind of allowing people to empower themselves basically yeah that's yeah oh yeah actually I, I think um, I, I haven't introduced myself because um, I'm Phil. I'm not really a healer, but I am a relaxation therapist because I used to make relaxation chairs and the process of selling one of these chairs involved me relaxing people. So I um, have this experience. And, and I recently discovered why I might have got into that um, because I had a motorbike accident when I was 23 and um, bashed my pelvis and forehead into the, into, I don't know what, I think that, that hit the car and this hit the tank. And, um, well, you didn't really notice much, and carried on. But recently I've had this sort of release and there's all these back pains and stuff. So I think I did develop some problems. And this chair that sort of, you put yourself, your feet up and stretched your back, I think helped me. And I got into sort of, you know, promoting relaxation. So, uh, that, yeah, so this, this is one of the themes, isn't it? So you, in order to be a, a, the alternative form of healer, you, you take charge of your own health first and so to become responsible for it. So, you, you, know, you know, like Daniel was saying about the um, endless medication, you know, this is the medication that you take for the rest of your life. And yeah, like these glasses, in fact, I've had a debate with the doctor about glasses because it's one, you know, why the hell they give you these things and you have to, you know, there's no question of a cure. But, well, there is now actually, isn't there? They do surgery, so yeah. Maybe. That seems a little bit unnatural. Yeah, but it, it, the, the eyes are muscle as well. So if you work on them, they will, they will get, I, I had the Sangita, my daughter, like she, she had glasses and then she didn't like them. So she didn't wear and she, after a few months, we went back to a check, eyes check, and then really? I say, well, you don't need glasses anymore. Wow. I mean, I go, maybe it's because you didn't wear them, because you felt shy, or, and uh, yes, you have strong eyes now, and there are a lot of exercises. Cool. And How old is she? So she's going to be 14. And when did she get the glasses? Well... When? 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 How old was she when she got glasses? She was she was five or six, wow. and she needed them for read, and 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 now she can read without them, and and look from far away as well. She needs did them. You, did I'd you like do anything with her about it, or you know, was there any? No, I, I was at the beginning. I was like, come on, where? I don't like it. I don't like it. It's very uncomfortable. And then she she had a lot of headaches at the beginning because she was not wearing them, but. In one point, the headaches finish and her eyes start working properly. I, um, I had a friend who was um, a teacher and she went to work in Mongolia. Well, and she said that there wasn't a single person who wore glasses in Mongolia. Um, and um, she did wear glasses. And she said um, the reason why was everybody at school from the age of five, they all did eye exercises. And it was part of the school curriculum. Oh, that's amazing. It is, mm. yeah. Like Very it. clever. It's because it's while you're growing, you, you you put the children into these things that force their eyes to grow wrong. Probably. They get lazy and yeah, they don't want to fix afterwards anyway. Mm. But yeah, and this this is this is this is ubiquitous across all Western medicine, isn't it? You you're trying to make you a, a, um, a cash cow for the rest yeah. of your life. It's business. <laughs> yeah, I remember finding some uh, uh, qigong like exercises for the eye, probably again in like my like twenties, where you just you massage, you know, massaging around the eyeball uh, in both directions, and then 
with the eyes closed, you'd like circle them one way and circle them the other way. And I did it pretty religiously every day for probably about six months or so, maybe a bit less than six months. And my vision was really good <laughs> after that. Uh, yeah. Well, and, that's uh, great, Daniel. I think I might give it a go. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's, yeah. So did you have, you didn't have glasses or anything like that? I did. I have like stigmatism, right? So one eye, like if I do this, one eye is a little bit fuzzy, yeah. right? And this eye is like pretty okay yeah so this the eyeball is like a little bit of different shape right and then one side mm. so but you know i did this i was wearing glasses to read otherwise i felt a little funny um but i did this massage and uh mm. i every now and then i still like think about it and do it and i don't wear glasses to read now <laughs> i probably should probably why <laughs> everything i read is a little funny yeah. um there's no it's um because I had a guy who worked for me, he was um, a roofer, and uh, he said at one point, he said, yes, that at some point in his 20s, he started doing some course, so he's back in education, and uh, for two years, and he had to work at book, books and stuff, and he went short-sighted, um, needed glasses for everything, and then finished that, went back on the roofs, where there's a lot of, you know, where you're looking at the distance a lot and not looking at print, and he, his eyes just got better. So... Mm, like vistas and, yes. and natural light. Yeah, yeah it's natural like light. Ga also gazing, like long distance, quite good for your eyes. And presumably didn't wear the glasses. He stopped wearing He didn't wear them all the time. Yeah. So, yes, that's, this is... I reckon that's an interesting study. It'd be nice to... There's no, but the thing is, all these um, intrinsically good things for us, you know, human beings, mm. are not uh, economic, are they? they? They don't serve any economic function, so there's no propaganda. Oh, go, you must go and get your eyes tested, or you must learn do this exercise, because if you do this exercise, we make money. No, we don't make money. If you do this exercise, we don't make money, so there's no reason to make you do the exercise. Yeah. This is why we've got to take charge of our health. Oh, this is this is like a you know this is a public information broadcast. Okay. So um, did you? So yeah. So it's okay. Are we going to are we going to talk about our um, wounded healer sort of aspects then? How you got into it, Raquel? More because <laughs> I, I mean. You're too, yeah, well, well, you know, like Chiron, the planet, is, is everyone sort of uh, used to talk about the Chiron being the wounded healer in the yeah. astrology. And uh, oh. people people who, you know, are in healing are always going you know, get into it for, for that reason. Yeah. They've got uh, problems themselves. Or they, they initially had problems, they solved it. Yeah, well, mine is not very solved. <laughs> I just it. <accept> it's <laughs> not a big yeah. problem. It's not a health yeah. problem. Yeah. But if if I was if I stay in Spain, I will have a very big health problem. Really? Yes. Well, in one if I wasn't strong enough, like they, when I was eighteen, they offered me in the big hospital, like in like a university hospital in the north of Spain. And I was used to go there to the dermatology. <clears throat> and in one point they say, okay, the after treat me like a guinea pig, <laughs> like they try everything on me, like every single crazy thing you can imagine and nothing works. And then my man, oh, and then they say, okay, we give you a house, we give you a monthly payment and you come and we try test different things to treat alopecia. And then my man was like, oh yeah, that's it your life is sorry i mean i look at my mommy like no way I, I don't want i i've been taking drugs from the kennies like all my life and and then i just say okay that's it i don't want her anymore and and it was a bit crazy that she was so happy that <laughs> i was gonna be she so thought you were gonna get you were gonna help be helped by it absolutely. yeah i know crazy woman <laughs> crazy <laughs> but because yeah that's did you, um, 
I mean, there's this mystery of why did you why did it go away when you went to India? You you grew hair in India, isn't that right? I did grow hair in India, yeah. And, and there's there's absolutely no answer to that. No. <laughs> That's such a weird thing. <laughs> no answer. It's just I don't know really what is there. I fell at home when I arrived first time, and is is the only thing I don't know. I I don't really know. But I didn't do anything different. I did after, but I had my hair when I started doing my course of Ayurveda and doing the Panchakarma, the full cleaning of the system. But I already had my hair there. So, what, the what, so, what, so how long were you in India before the hair started growing back? My hair started growing back as soon as I put my feet in India. I The first time I went there, I went for six months and after two, three weeks, I start getting black, a little black, and start growing and growing and growing and. and It'd be yeah. really interesting to see if that happened again if you went there. <laughs> yeah. Do you think it would? Yes, I had my hair for many years because I used to go back oh, for see. six so months. It was yes. very reliable. It, it always was, worked. It always worked. It, it wasn't. Too. Well, I didn't lose it all until because I, we didn't have enough time. Six months in England. Or in Europe, it wasn't long enough. I lose pieces, but then I was back again six months after, and then all grow, and then coming back, lose a few. But then when my daughter was five, she started school, and and that's it. <laughs> all gone. <laughs> you think it was a temperature thing? I don't know, because where I come from, is very hot as well, and very sunny, and it, it's not, I don't think it's heat. I grow up in the heat, very hot. <laughs> Does it feel different to be in India? Do you in a different process somehow? I, I don't know. I, I, uh, I feel really like I love India. I love the way they live. They used to live. I'm sure they changed in the last eight or nine years. <laughs> mm. But I, I just felt like this is the the real life. Like people have to go pick up bring the water from the ground, take it home and do the, I don't know, it was the, the, the life that we all still have. No electricity, no TV, no laptop, no computer, no, nothing. <laughs> A lot of cows <laughs> and monkeys. Actually, I just and heard this, this healing therapy. Have you heard of it where you bury yourself in the, it's like an extreme form of earthing. You bury yourself in the earth. Bury yourself in you just bury. I mean, you could probably do it on the beach. It's, you know, you could in just the soil, bury, in the soil, in the soil, in the yeah, path. go into the woods and you bury yourself. You know, it's that you know, the idea of just yeah, take your shoes off and walk around. I mean, could it be something like that? Yeah. Were you barefoot? I was, yeah, you were barefoot. I, it was the first thing happened to me, yeah, for so what about years. that? Why don't you try England, being actually. really? Ah. So you're, yes, so I just, just, uh, just wondered if it was a barefoot thing. Oh, yeah, I had to wear them here because I was a bit cold, even in the summer. <laughs> but mm. yeah, at the beginning, I, I refused to put suit. I was like, no, no suit. Because in India, I just arrived in India, and the second day, big woman with big dress come to me, and then my suit disappeared. And I bought some, and it break. Yeah, they, they stole my suit. <laughs> So in one point, after buying a few pair and they all broke in and said, you know what? No suit <laughs> anymore. Anyway, you have to take them all the time to go through a holy breed or through a holy thing. So no suit. <laughs> it was... that, what, what is that word? I'm, I'm, I'm missing the word. What's the word? Suit. Shoes. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Shoes. Yeah. So yeah. You have to wear shoes in a holy place. You think it no, you, the way no, you, have. you have to take them off. You have to I take, have to take them, them off. off. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. So, so I just decided don't work. And the clock as well. I have a watch, I remember. And when I arrived in the airport, this little boy said, what is this? I mean, like, it's a watch. And he took it away and threw it. He said, it's not time here. You wake up with the sun and go to bed with the sun. And that's it. I mean, I, all right. <laughs> I'm open to everything. <laughs> Since then, I don't have any in my, no, never again. <laughs> it's definitely resonating with Deborah. Deborah has a whole anti-watch and no shoes period. Yeah. 
And I, I, I stopped wearing a watch a long time ago because I found that I just kept looking at it all the time. It made me really nervous. So, you know, I don't I don't wear a watch anymore. I, I'm pretty clear about what time it is and I don't really feel the need for a watch anymore. Mm. And shoes, I spent some quite a long time without wearing shoes as well. I'd much rather, whenever I teach, I always take my shoes off. Yeah, you must be grounding a bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I agree. Was that one, because you had your example from last week of the, of the patient that will never be named, of course, but who objected to the fact that you didn't wear a white coat. Did she also object to the fact that you were barefoot? Yeah, she didn't like that at all. Oh, I, I wasn't wearing a white coat. I wasn't wearing, you know, proper shoes. And, <laughs> and you know, the building was a funny colour. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, the colour of the room makes a massive difference to how much you heal. Uh, but she did <laughs> heal. But she did still object it. That was the very, very... Yeah, that was weird. That was weird. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I... Yeah, I, I am. I was when I heard this thing about burying yourself. I did think I'd quite like to try that. So I hadn't mm. done anything like that for a long time. You know, it's a bit namby pamby what we've done, which is you know our, our earthing thing on the bed. It's, not good enough. It's not very rad, is it? I've got a, a little allotment. If you want, I ah. need. <laughs> and everybody look at me. Where are your shoes? Did you? Um, I'm in the ground. I'm sitting hard. Like, I don't choose. We can offer it. Men. <laughs> I think they did it in Mutant Message Down Under. Do you, does anyone read that book? Mutant Message Down Under. They buried him <laughs> for some reason. I think I'm too claustrophobic to be buried. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think. I think your, head, your head's out. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> head's out. It's just buried the body. That's a relief. Know. <laughs> well, I assume so. Like you absorb absorb something from the soil. Yes. I, I'd want to do it in good soil. Yeah, like nice quality I agree. soil. Minerals. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's it. I'm, I mean, there's that salt room, isn't there? That's a bit like that because you're you're in this mm. sort of very damp, probably salt, damp. And that's good for the lungs, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. I know people who do hot stone massage. They uh, every now and then they have to. They often like bury their stones, right? Oh, really? Take them and bury them back in the garden and leave them for a couple. You know, leave them for a while and then rotate them and like they that kind of lose sense. lose their. Yeah, that's yeah. a way to clean crystals as well, isn't it? To bury them in the soil. Clean crystals. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, put them in the ground and they get like Energy. their mineral composition like balances. Yeah. Put them back in the. And we used to have, we had a, a, a guy who was a healer from um, New Zealand and um, he used to go down to the beach and then choose his stones and then he'd come and, and you know, massage with stones from the beach. And so whenever he went anywhere, he always used to go and find the local stones to use to massage, which I thought was really interesting. That Maori guy with the yeah. tattoos. Yeah. Oh, I saw him. Yeah, it was quite impressive. Yeah, he was. Everybody screamed a lot, though, so he must have been pretty full on. <laughs> yeah, he was very muscly, and yeah, it was He was, yeah. <laughs> it's a collection of stones. <laughs> <laughs> Did he throw them at you? I don't know. <laughs> I think he was just very heavy. Do you know mm. what I mean? He was a pretty muscly guy, so... I reckon he used those stones quite strongly. And I liked the fact that he went to get them, you know, and then he'd put them yeah. back afterwards and stuff and he chose them carefully. I thought that was really cool. Well, we both went to see one of the Anahata patients, one of the Anahata therapists who gave us something along those lines, shamanic, with local stones and herbs and things that she bought on the day. Yeah. You know, she, she, so it was like the healing that she was giving us involved picking up, now what's her name? What are you asking? What, what's the lady's name? That it's treats... Eva, and she was going to be here tonight, oh. but she can't, so she's coming next time, and she's very keen. Yay. Well, that's cool. Yeah, no, no, because she had stones and things, and I, you know, came home with stones from the healing. 
and of, yeah of... and actually talking about stones we've got some stones from the alps haven't we because i've got a thing about the stones from the alps and i put them we put them all around the house yeah I mean, it's almost like there's this whole technology which we sort of vaguely remember from some Atlantean past, but we don't really believe in it. Or, you know, certainly it's the unconscious, isn't it? All this energy work. Do you know what I mean? It's like people, the woo. This is the woo. It's what, you know, what is not included in our world. It's, but it's obviously important. I mean, when I'm, yeah, because I, I also um, had this healing, recent healing experience where the um, craniosacral lady told me, I'm, I'm repeating from last week, but it's okay because last week's not there. But um, I, I had the um, horrible maths teacher who used to whack you around the leg when I was 11. And they just, I mean, so we were doing maths, but we were getting whacked around the leg. Somehow these things were, I saw no linkage, you know. We didn't, we'd never have been whacked by, at all. It was not necessary. And we were in fear of this whacking. And um, I was moaning on about that while she was healing some part of me. And she said, because she sort of encourages that. You're in a state, actually. And then um, she said, you can go out and go in the woods. So I could, so she freed my 11 year old to go into the woods. I didn't have to stay in that wretched maths lesson anymore. Oh. So, um, I don't know, I, I'm saying that in relation to this idea that we are um, the unconscious, you know, the, we're, we're unconscious of what the hell's going on, actually, even, even though we embrace the world of healing and, you know, I mean, obviously, you guys, you acupuncturists, know something about energy and stuff. And, you know, Qigong is, is energy. But we're not, I don't know. And, you know, we, we meet wise people who seem to know more about it. There are people who can do with things with Qi, aren't there? Yeah. It's not part of collective, consensus reality. Not here. No. So this is the Wu Warriors. No, we're called the Second Opinion. <laughs> but I like Wu Warriors better. Just, <laughs> um, yes, because basically the Second Opinion will always be something to do with the energetic of the situation, won't it? Because there's because clearly, you know, it's ridiculous to think that everything's going to be sold by chemicals from the oil industry. So that's where we're at at the moment. I had a weird experience when I was, um, when my kids were little, I had a, a really difficult um, problem with my hands and they were, I looked like a leper and nobody would touch my hands and it was really painful and um, awful. And I went to the doctor and the doctor said, oh, you know, she gave me some cream and it was a corticosteroid cream. So I put that on and it made it better for a bit. But the moment I'd stopped putting the cream on, it got worse and it spread and it was a bloody nightmare. And so um, I went back to the doctor and the doctor said, oh, you know, there's this special clinic that they're holding at the at the hospital. You could go along there and maybe they'll find some special medication for you. But they didn't tell me what they didn't tell me that I only discovered on the day was that um, this special clinic was actually uh, run by the pharmaceutical companies so that they could um, try out new um, new drugs on people who had skin issues. So the way that the, the doctor put it to me was that if you had a problem with your skin, you know, people who had intractable skin issues, they ran these clinics once a month or so, or once every two or three months, and you could go there and then they might help you. And they didn't say, you know, how or why. So anyway, I turned up for this, um, this appointment and they stuck you in different rooms. And, um, and I sat there and at that time, I'd only just started studying acupuncture and I was reading a book about um, women healers or something like that. So, you know, it was, it was really interesting. It was just a book about women doctors and how they were underappreciated and whatever. 
And then, um, you know, nobody explained what was going to happen. But basically, these teams of doctors would come round. They'd be like four or five doctors at a time. And then they'd look at you. So obviously, they had different people in different rooms. And so they'd discuss them. And they'd discuss them in front of you. Because the assumption was that you wouldn't have anything to say. And uh, as far as I could tell. And um, so it was really, it was very, very disempowering, to be honest. Um, and but, you know, I didn't know what was going on and, and my eyes were sort of closed to it. And uh, and so, you know, the first lot came through and they discussed me and blah, blah, blah. And then they went off. And then the second lot went through and they discussed me and then blah, blah, as if I wasn't there. And then <laughs> off they went. And then the, another lot came through. And in this lot was my doctor, my GP. And, um, you know, you know what it's like for GPs. They see like so many patients that they obviously don't remember you. And um, and and so, you know, I said, oh, hello. And uh, and then this this doctor said she was a lady and she said um, she said, oh, oh, you know, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm one of your patients and you recommended that I come here. And uh, and she said, oh, yes, I remember you're the ring allergy lady, aren't you? And I thought hang on a minute, I've never worn a ring in my life. I mean, I, you know, nowadays I do, but at the time I didn't. And I definitely didn't have a ring allergy. So I knew that it wasn't a ring allergy. He said, no, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't wear rings. Mm. And she said, yes, you do. You're the ring allergy lady. <laughs> and I thought, oh dear, you know, this, this, oh, this person obviously hasn't been listening to me. And then, and then, and then, um, and then I said, well, what's going on here what is this all about and she said oh you know we're we're um we're trying out new medication to see if it's going to help you or not and I thought oh right okay so so who runs this and he said oh um it's the pharmaceutical companies they you know they organize these that was it for me I just left and I you know I don't know what they might have recommended but I I didn't wait any longer and that was the end of that. And that was when I then decided that I needed to find an alternative. And just like I found an alternative when my when I was really ill, when I was 19 and I tried an alternative in this case, I, you know, I decided that Chinese herbs was the way to go. And I ended up having two years of Chinese herbs and it completely sorted me out. Yeah. So there you go. So, you know, with the idea of feeling disempowered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and also and that's, not, that's very similar to Raquel's story, although Raquel narrowly avoided it. But that sounds like you've been in the similar... You're not better than me, because I was totally blind to the situation. Nobody told me anything, you know. And there's this whole attitude that, you know, you, you don't know anything about your own body, you know, and you don't want to kind of do something for yourself. It, it was it was just horrible. They just treat you like a thing. <laughs> Well, just yeah exactly like you know obviously you don't know anything about your body and and you know you're you're at their service for them to try things out and i just thought i'm not doing that i mean this, i've got i've got this two, definition of this sort of science it's called having it done to us science or hit us as opposed to doing it to get the science where yeah. you're trying things on yourself yeah so well i mean chinese herbs were still having it done to me but it was a it was yeah. a it was a you know, it was a process. I'd go back and I'd say, yeah, that was better or was a bit worse. Or... Feedback. And we changed that. We, you know, he changed the, you know, I think that's what happens with Chinese herbs. Maybe Daniel can help us here. Um, mm. You know, it's a continuous thing, isn't it? You don't just get one thing and then you keep on using that. Every time I'd go back and then he'd adjust the prescription a little bit and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It was amazing. I mean, really what was amazing was seeing these babies that were there you know, when I was in the waiting room and I'd see this baby who was covered in eczema and then, you know, I'd still be coming and then this baby would be <laughs> like three months later or six months later and they'd be completely clean, you know, beautifully, perfectly fine. That was amazing to me, you know. Do babies take herbs then or do they rub it on the babies? No, I think, I think they had to have it. I think it's an oral thing, you know, but it was it amazing. Depends, yeah. Sometimes they can give it through the mother if they're breastfeeding. But well, that's cool. Yeah. But um, yeah, you would normally just give them a small dose, basically, just like a like a quarter of the dose, I guess, based on their size. Mm. Tricky. I haven't tried to get a baby to take herbs, so that would be a new one for me. 
<laughs> well, I mean, my, I used to boil the herbs at home and mm. uh, my children refused to go anywhere near the kitchen. I was basically boiling them every other day. And my children were like, oh, my God, that stinks so much, you know, but I, I didn't care because I was desperate. And after a while, actually, you get quite used to it. I know people always complain about Chinese herbs, but mm. I actually quite like them really in the end. It's always licorice. I like that. I don't like licorice at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I used to smoke licorice papers. Ugh, disgusting stuff. <laughs> Isn't that one of the ones that's always in there because it sort of gets the chi flow or something? Uh, licorice is it's also what it does is it kind of detoxifies a little bit like the other herbs so licorice has a kind of detoxifying and kind of harmonizing so it kind of com helps the the formula as a whole mm. yeah it's a unifying sort of thing mm. yeah so usually you just have like you might have uh 10 or 15 grams of all these herbs but licorice you only have three or four so you just have a little bit of it in there. Oh. Just to bring it all, well, it's a, it might be just for the flavour. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's also, to, yeah, and to, there was not, well, not for the, yeah, for the taste, because the taste is part of the medicine, right, with the herbs, so the taste, but uh, so it's like a sweet kind of unifying taste, and it kind of like, I guess, unifies the other herbs, but they say it takes away some toxicity um, from from the others. So it's a little bit like the earth, really. You know, you kind of put things in there to cleanse them a bit, and it also kind of unifies things and pulls it all together. Yeah, yeah. So there are there in Chinese herbal medicine, there are the three sweet herbs that they often have in there. That, so licorice, mm, ginger. I mean, it's not sweet, but it's in there. It's like licorice, ginger, and Chinese dates. Oh, jujube or whatever they're called. Red yeah, date. yeah, jujubes. I never know jujubes. how to pronounce it. <laughs> or uh, datsao, datsao, or hongsao. Oh, right, hongsao. I know that was hongsao. No, hongsao, same here. Recently, when, um, when I got the flu, I, um, I had a load of uh, hongsao and um, goji berry tea, actually, mm. as a sort of uh, a, a pick-me-up, a sort of blood-building type tea, and that was really nice. Yeah, like sweet, sort of sweet nourishing. Um, yeah. 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 That's I, I, lo I, I love the fact that, um, you know, food is medicine. I love the fact that you can you can put together things and it makes you, you know, it, 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 it makes you better, basically. Like, you know, if I get a cold then I have garlic soup and, you know, if I feel that I need to strengthen my blood, then I'm going to have some hong tao. And do you know what I mean? I love things like that, that you can just do it and eat it. And that's that's great. That mm. that's brilliant for me. Yeah, and that's really, yeah, it's really useful for patients coming in, isn't it, as well, like to kind of give them, steer them a little bit towards um, using food. Yeah, and they you do that, can't you? It's not a big thing, do you know what I mean? It's just a small adjustment that makes a massive difference. Yeah, yeah and it's partly the mental adjustment, isn't it? Like it's like using food as something that cures you. Yes. Which, which is a step for, for, for some, oh, really? Hmm. Yeah, and but it is, it, but it is a, a difficult situation, though, isn't it? In I mean, I find that a difficult thing in the UK because of me being sort of more Italian and whatever. Is that I find it really difficult to talk about food and diet with with people in the UK because you know if if I ever approach the area of diet, people always say, "Oh, I've always got," they always say, "I've got a brilliant, I've got a really good diet," mm. and then you know I kind of ask them a little bit more, and they say, "Oh, well, you know, I always have." I always have a cheese sandwich for lunch, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, my God. And then, you know, I mean, I go shopping and I look at what people have in their trolleys. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just horrified, to be honest. And you can't you can't touch the vegetables when you go and buy them. And do you know what I mean? There's something not quite right. People are very detached from food, I find, in the UK. It's really different to Italy or Spain or France mm. or do you know what I mean? Yeah, there seems to be not very much middle ground. There's a kind of like detached from food or like people have an allotment and they grow their own and they have a lot of vegetables. Yeah. And it's like there, there seems to be not very, the two camps don't seem to like kind of, no. I don't, yeah. Yeah, it's sad really. Um, yeah, because I mean, what, one of the, probably the most useful uh, therapy to have would be, uh, what do they call them, nutritionists. 
but I feel they're also the most boring. And, you know, but then, you know, things like um, food, I love it. You know, I love eating. So why isn't nutrition about cooking? Why isn't the nutritionist about eating lovely stuff? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think that, it, I, yeah, it's a problem, isn't it? There's also that thing where people also get very sort of stuck about, I can't eat this and I can't eat that and I got to do this and I got to do that. And then and then that that sort of very harsh nature kind of ruins your it's like, enjoyment um, of, of eating. It's like the, yes, it's the adult, the sort of adult <laughs> forcing the child to eat something, which is yeah. actually an image from my childhood. My niece, I remember witnessing my niece sitting there at four o'clock very very thin she had a very round large mother and the battle of wills was going on the mm. child probably three years younger than me maybe nine seven sitting there having sat there for so many hours since lunch and being forced to eat this food that she didn't want to eat very and, weird isn't that i mean i don't yeah i mean i was labeled as a as a really bad eater as a child as well because um because i didn't eat everything and i was you know i was obviously very picky and i, I had a i had a real problem with my parents and food you know not because i was anorexic or bulimic or anything i just didn't really like a whole load of stuff that they insisted I had to eat. And so, you know, leaving home and being able to cook my own food was actually a massive liberation for me. And I discovered that there are all these things that I thought I didn't like. Actually, I really like them, you know, because I was freed from that. You've got to eat what's on your plate sort of thing. And I was very careful with my children not to ever make them do that. Because, uh, you know, I really don't think that's a very good idea. I'm just wondering whether that you know if you've had that sort of experience as a child that may, means that any kind of food you know you've got to if you're going to do a dietary change you've got to have your you've got to be free, yeah like you you've got to be free to eat what the hell you want and then choose what you you know like my uh, how you get how i gave up smoking because you have to remind yourself you're free to smoke however the consequences of eat, of smoking are that you carry on smoking forever so therefore you choose not to yeah yeah you've got to do it because you want to and and you know it's awful isn't it when people don't eat you know oh i'm you know i'm i won't i won't have dairy because i know that it's bad for me and i'm not going to you know it's all, all the should it, whenever it gets to the should words i always get really sort of a bit freaked out basically i think i think we should remove we should remove should <laughs> from the vocabulary basically yeah so true <laughs> i sometimes find like well not fine but i think from um with some patients with diet where i feel like this is going to be difficult to change what they're eating i just start with them with like so let's just change at the base level how how we're eating yeah. so let's say in the day when you're eating your meals you try to not eat and work and you try to like be in a relaxed state and enjoy that time and just have that time be a be a very relaxing time for you you know and that's going to be like a first step <laughs> like in the how to how we're going to change your diet and your um or I use totally, food as medicine totally you. agree and the, and the other thing that i do which is similar you know but for me it isn't i don't i haven't had that conversation about the relaxation but thank you for reminding me is that i always talk about um the Chinese clock and the fact that there are certain hours of the day when different organs have got different um, strengths and weaknesses. And I and I remind them that seven till nine in the morning is stomach time and that mm. most people eat their main meal at seven between seven and nine in the evening, which is the opposite time of stomach time. So if their digestive system isn't working very well, then that's the worst possible time to be eating. And, you know, just those kind of things. And they're like, oh, I never knew that. You know what I mean? And that kind of entrains them in the idea of kind of maybe eating more for breakfast and eating less for dinner and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you better they say after the sunset, your, your digestive system doesn't work. So you should not eat because all the food you don't digest. And then in the morning when you, the first thing you eat, you digest the food from the day before that is already yeah. bad, rotten and... No, yeah, not fully rotten, but yeah, all this is toxin yes. coming to your blood from the intestine that is all stuck there. So, 
it to- I mean, it totally makes sense. And, you know, you know, and we know this anyway, because we've got those sayings like, you know, you eat like a you have breakfast like a king and lunch like a prince and, you know, dinner like a pauper. That's like an English saying something like that. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, we know this. It's just that we don't you know, we don't sort of use it as a it's just it's just like hearsay. You know, like my mum used to say, you can't go out like that. Your tummy's going to get really cold and you'll get cold in your stomach and then you'll have problems with your digestion. And I remember thinking, what a load of rubbish. But it was only when I started studying Chinese medicine that I realized that actually you can have cold in your stomach and it does cause problems. And she was right. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know what I mean? It's all those kind of old wives tales. A lot of them are really true, you know. Yeah, here we push the old people away from us, so we don't learn all this. No. <laughs> you just like, keep them in the house alone. Yeah, it's horrible. Because they're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> they need more than us <laughs> in the better oh. time. <laughs> yeah, they have a much longer time to learn, to learn and understand much more than we do. So, you know, I've learned yeah. some jolly useful things from crazy old ladies in ma- on mountains, tops and stuff. So. Yeah, that's and I hope to be one of those crazy old ladies mm. when I get older. I'm sure you will. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but no, it's it's yes, it's like the uh, the forgotten bits of uh, knowledge. I mean, God, how much is forgotten? Just it's unbelievable. Even you can see it now. Just talking, you know, to Ruben. You know what? 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 Talking about the seventies or something? You know. If you'd let, if just if you were uh, stripping wallpaper off in most flats, which haven't been, nothing's happened, get down to a certain layer in England, which is all purple, which is when when the seventies happened, and it's ubiquitous or everywhere. Yeah. Anyway, why? why? Probably why? goes with avocado toilets, doesn't yeah. it? Oh. That was later. I think that was later. Oh, you think that was later? Avocado toilets. I'm not in the 80s. Oh. Yeah, I mean, we can imagine the health knowledge that has been lost over time. You know, I'm thinking about uh, there was, you know, a period of Chinese medicine. I'm sure Deborah can talk more about it than me, but there was like a whole period called the stomach and spleen school, right? Which is like the school of the stomach, I guess, the digestive school. And uh, I think that period lasted for something like 200 years, something like this, like where the main, you know, and what do we have from that now? We have like maybe one or two books. And, but <laughs> the, That's really interesting. So the sort of like periods of, stu- of, of, of sort of fashion, I suppose, in health, essentially, but 200 years. Well, like I a, mean, yeah, in Chinese medicine, they have different layers, don't they? Of, of, you know, somebody writes a book and then everybody gets obsessed with that and then they have another layer and, do you know what I mean? So there was a time period when people were... It was all about the stomach and the spleen. Yeah, the Ping, ping Wei Lun. Ping and Wei then yeah. Ping Wei Lun, stomach and spleen school. So, I mean, it must have come... You know, it must have been a whole totality of health ideas. Mm. But what we have from that is a small fragment. Um. But I think, yeah, their idea, like part of, I guess, a little bit of it was that the stomach is like the root of your body, right? So the root of, of your, what's see, not the root, the seed. So you put the seed in to the stomach and then it grows and that's the, your energy. It's kind of magic really, isn't it? Really, when you think about it, we put food in and we get energy <laughs> and then we can live. So. Yeah. Well, maybe um, people don't even think that what they eat is what they are. Hmm. I mean, it is, though, isn't it? It makes your physical form. You know, where does the physical form come from? It's from the stuff that we eat and the stuff we drink and the air around us. It's pretty obvious. And, yeah, because 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 it's, it's what, what coming up for me is this. Um, I remember going to visit this chap in hospital and we came to visit him. He was in a really you know, bad state. Uh, you know, he's a bit fed up. Really. He was not in a good mood. He'd had, he'd, he'd had his hip done twice and he's in the wrong hospital and he was fed up. And we came to try and cheer him up with loads, with a takeaway and some wine. And we sort of, you know, ate it. And the nurse said, Oh dear, you mustn't drink the wine because your blood pressure will go up. And uh, so 
afterwards they did take his blood pressure and actually had gone up you know he'd had fun we'd had fun you know and it, it, he was in a much better mood so um that's and the you, that's the, talking about food do you remember our neighbor who's not with us anymore yeah. and um she was she had a she had an operation she had a bowel operation actually didn't she and then they put her in a in a um it was a ward for um recovery ward wasn't it and we were bringing her home cooked food we had to sneak it in because they didn't want to let us bring it in because they they wanted to give her you know because she was like she liked she had a garden and she cooked she made all grew her own vegetables and she cooked and so we knew that she she wanted good food and um they were giving her this horrible slop and we were bringing her good food and they wouldn't let us you know we had to literally sneak it in I mean, that's crazy <laughs> Yeah, what the hell? I mean, it is. It, I mean, it's it almost it, every aspect of, um, you know, what they call the health service, it seems to be completely the opposite, isn't it? You know, the food. Yeah, they just want to kill us. Mmm. 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 I wonder if they give you nice food in Indian um, Indian hospitals because I remember they used to have we used to have really nice food on Indian trains. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I've never been in a hospital in India. No, me neither. I, I looked once and thought, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been sick in India. I never I, I don't get sick anywhere, so I never been. Lucky you. Yeah. Yeah. I never been in the GP here. I never, never take my kids to the GP. Like no way. <laughs> do, do, do you, who would you? What would be your port of call if you had some health issue? I, I first, I always treat myself with homeopathy and yeah, acupuncture. Physically, I acupuncture. I think is amazing. Like probably other aspects as well, but I never try for other reason that pain. So, but yeah, homeopathy, I'm, I'm, I've got my big sweet, I did a little call, very small, only like first ID stuff, but I've got a book and I just, every time something happens, it doesn't happen big thing, but well, Sangita in Thailand, she get a big bad back in her stomach and she had high temperature for seven days, like she was just there. <laughs> And I, I refused to take her to the hospital. I'm like, no, you're not going there. They're not going to give you anything. So with citrusal and homeopathy and anything I found that I had in my in my first ID kit. <laughs> and I think it's much better. Like, it, you can see more with kids that they are so clean. They, they it work. Homeopathy works very good. Yeah, homeopathy is brilliant for children. I totally agree. Yeah. So I have for myself, I just have my my kids book because it's for kids <laughs> but i use it oh, really? it's so simple to yeah to, to see the illness you have everything so so you you would so you look at the book and you you choose the remedies from that yeah. you have a set you have a set of remedies i've got a lot of remedies <laughs> and i just, you them. I yeah. just found something new oh that's so i put it in my kit <laughs> Do you, do you, and your kit, so you have a kit that you will always go with, that you always have everything. Yeah, it's a big thing, <laughs> but I always carry everywhere. I even had, like, like everybody put their self jacks when they travel to India, and I don't, I don't agree with anything coming to my blood <laughs> or my body, so I... I for Sangita as well. My mom was like, Oh, you're gonna take your baby to India without vaccines and without anything. You're well, of course, she would be stronger if she get anything. And I just went to the dolphin clinic, and the homeopath gave me a little kit for uh, for malaria and a lot of big things. And he said, I give you a few remedies. And then in India, in Calcutta, is the biggest homeopathic hospital in the world, so you have enough remedies to take your daughter to the hospital there and then they can treat her there and um, but i never had i never used them i still have the kids there we never get anything we've been drinking eating food with rats and everything around and we oh. never get anything yeah i think it's eat a lot of garlic and a lot of chili and you feel everything <laughs> in the food that's it 
but That's yeah, true. never. My like every time, like with the school, I, I, your, the GP of your daughter. You, I don't even know his name. I never saw him. <laughs> you have some, but I don't know. I hate them. <laughs> I don't. Oh, yeah, no, I means they don't do anything good for you. They just give you stuff to. I, I don't know, like a junkie or something that keep yeah. taking stuff. Keep your south mouth, your mouth fat, and keep buying medicine, <laughs> business. <laughs> well, this is pretty hardcore talking. <laughs> you because know, if I if I write anything about this, the newsletter rather tells me not to. Yeah, so, we'll have to chop it up, Phil. Yes. <laughs> you think you have to edit it? You're serious? Yeah, You're not you have serious. to edit. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I'm I'm with Raquel. I'm totally with Raquel, but I do think we have to edit. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, don't apologise. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I don't. Well, since I'm going to be the editor, I, I'm not sure. I'll see how. <laughs> what, what have we done? We just said we just said it as it is. I don't think we've said. Anything. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so yes, I mean we're we're now we've done about what forty minutes of chit chat. So, I think we've done um, over an hour, Phil. Have we? Yeah. Oh, really? All oh, right. So we've we've given up. You know, we've delighted our audience enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually really nice to meet you, Daniel. And you know, I mean, if if I, I, you know, this is uh, this is not, you know, this has been a success. I'm so sorry about starting late. I mean, we need to have a regular, you know, because I was I was. I was already wound up about this yesterday, was, you know, it was, and then I forgot it, so that's terrible. But, um, <laughs> so, yes, but we've recovered nicely, and I don't, I, seamlessly, apparently. Um, is there anything we want to um, finish up with? Um, you know, the important message from the sponsor. <laughs> we endorse <laughs> the use of diet for your health. And to keep yeah. of your health. Empower yourself. Yeah. Come to the Anahata and learn to empower yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And and um, we're, we're eventually we're going to start, well, we're going to train this this format of it so that we can, um, well, this is, this is this is down the road a bit, where we, we sort of, we've talked a bit and uh, we'll invite people to come and have a second opinion so they can share their health stories. Um, you know, this is somebody who's watching this might want to uh, share their health stories and then they'll have experts. Not saying I'm an expert, but there's three, you know, we've got three here who are experts in everything they know. And there's quite a lot they know. So, you know, you'll get a second opinion and it will be something like something about diet, probably, by the sounds of it. So maybe Qigong acupuncture, Ayurvedic medicine, mm. and, you know, all sorts of common sense stuff from this perspective. So um, I think we're, if we're done, I'll, I'll say thank you very much, everybody, and thanks to, for you know, being such great sports and coming on to Second Opinion, Second Second Opinion, <laughs> ever. And... Uh, Thanks very much, Daniel. Thanks, Raquel. Thanks, Ra, Debra. Thank you. Nighty night. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thanks. Nice. Yeah. Bye. How are you? Uh, do I have to do something? Mm -hmm.